Unit 5, arthropods. Uh, arthropods are the most numerous phylum on Earth. Uh, between 70% and 85% of all named organisms are in the phylum. Arthropods, like annelids, are segmented invertebrates. Uh, so just like mollusks and annelids, they... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, just like annelids, they're segmented. Um, like mollusks and annelids, uh, arthropods also undergo protostome development. And just like all three of them, just like all three of them, just like uh, as well as the echinoderms and chordates, they have a coelomate. Let's spell it correctly: coelomate body plan. Um, the main difference between the arthropods and the annelids is that arthropods have an exoskeleton with jointed appendages that allow for complex and uh, rapid movement. Like annelids, arthropods are segmented. Uh, this allows for, like we said, the efficient and complicated movement. Um, in some arthropods, like praying mantids, there are three main body parts. There's the head, which is uh, has mouth parts for feeding, uh, various types of eyes. They can be simple or complex or compound eyes. Uh, many arthropods have antennae, uh, long sensory structures that contain receptors for smell and touch. The middle is the thorax. Uh, the thorax is uh, a region consisting of about three main segments. And this is where legs and wings are going to attach. And the, uh, the most posterior side is the abdomen. And the abdomen contains the reproductive and the digestive organs. Uh, we may find other legs. We may find other legs um, attached back here in the abdomen. Um, some arthropods, like the crayfish, um, still have the abdomen. It's still the most posterior, but the head and the thorax are uh, are fused together into a cephalothorax. Um, remember that prefix cephalo means head, just like our cephalopods, our cephalopods are phylum of our group of mollusks, um, cephalopods were the head-footed mollusks. Uh, in addition to the segmented body, arthropods have a hard exoskeleton. Um, the exoskeleton provides a framework for support, uh, protection, and provides um, provides a barrier against water loss in terrestrial animals. Um, also provides a location for muscle attachment. The, uh, the exoskeleton in arthropods is made of chitin. It's a nitrogen-containing polysaccharide bound with protein. Um, some of the exoskeletons, like in grasshoppers, can be leathery, which will still offer some protection. Um, but others will infuse some calcium salts into them, and it will harden them to a point where a hammer is going to be needed to, uh, to crack them. Arthropods have paired appendages. Uh, structures such as legs and antennae that grow and extend from the body. Um, and by paired, it means that if we look here, so the antenna, there, it's paired. There's two of them there. We see the two, the pair of legs here, pair of legs here, and you can kind of see the other leg back there, and then here, and then you can kind of see the last little bit back over here. But there's paired jointed appendages. Um, that's kind of a big thing. Uh, it's a jointed appendage, um, which means that it, uh, it it can bend and it can move. These uh, these appendages are adapted for a variety of functions. Uh, they are used for feeding. They're used for mating, uh, sensing, walking, and swimming. Uh, we mentioned that the exoskeleton is uh, is made of chitin, uh, which means that it's a non-living material. Since it's non-living, it can't grow as the organism grows. Therefore, the exoskeleton must be shed in a process called molting. The uh, process of molting is very similar to if we had an enclosed uh, container of water and we started to freeze it. Well, the, uh, the volume of ice 
is greater than the volume of liquid water. So as, as the water freezes, the volume expands. So as it expands, it starts to press against the outer portions of the container. As it continues to freeze, more pressure is going to eventually be made until that glass cracks. Well, the same thing happens with the exoskeleton of the arthropod. Okay? A fluid is initially, a fluid is initially um, excreted to help soften, to help soften the exoskeleton, um, and the new exoskeleton starts to get formed underneath it. Uh, as that new exoskeleton continues to to grow, uh, it keeps exerting pressure on it until it cracks. And once the original exoskeleton cracks, um, the animal can just uh, essentially walk out. Here we see the old exoskeleton of the tarantula. Uh, it's left over as the new tarantula, as the, new, as the tarantula uh, leaves it, uh, surrounded by its new one. Um, the uh, the new exoskeleton after it goes through it's not completely hardened, uh, which means that an arthropod would be most vulnerable uh, right after molting. Uh, that new exoskeleton isn't fully hardened. Um, in order to help, in order to help that arthropod gain a little bit of growing room in their um, blood circulation increases throughout all of the animal. Uh, Causing it to causing it to kind of swell up, and that swell up swelling up allows for uh, for room underneath the uh, underneath the new exoskeleton. Uh, it's very similar to uh, something that something that a ra uh, escape artists might do uh, if they're getting bound with with rope or um, if they're getting bound with rope or chains or in a straitjacket or something like that. Um, flexing the muscles and making yourself as big as possible. Because when you then relax, you're going to have some wiggle room, um, and that's what help. That's one of the things that helps escape artists get rid, get out of, um, get out of their bindings. Uh, the great diversity among arthropods is reflected in the variety of feeding habits and feeding structures. The mouth parts of most arthropods uh, include a pair of appendages called mandibles. And these can be adapted for biting and chewing. Um, other arthropods have mouth parts that are modified, like uh, like a strainer or needles or uh, something to cut, like a sword or uh, things to suck, in a, like a straw. Um, the uh, to digest food, arthropods have a complete one-way digestive system with a uh, with a mouth, a gut, and an anus. Um, arthropods can be herbivores, carnivores, filter feeders, omnivores, or parasites. So given the fact that they can feed on a variety of different things, they're going to need a variety of different mouth parts to be able to accomplish that. As far as respiration goes, uh, arthropods obtain oxygen by using one of three structures. The first are gills. Um, and remember, it's going to be important to, uh, to maintain a certain homeostatic balance of oxygen in body tissues. Uh, it's going to enable animals to have energy for a bunch of different functions. Um, most aquatic arthropods have gills, uh, like you see in the crayfish. Uh, they function the same way as the gills and mollusks do. One of the things to note is that the, these gills are folded over, and uh, just like when we were looking at the clam or the squid, they kind of look like they kind of look like feathers, and these this is to do that to allow for the greatest air, surface area to be exposed. So when you look, there's all this surface area that a gill can be exposed to. It wouldn't be able to do it if it was just one flat um, one flat gill structure. The second is um, what's called tracheal tubes. Uh, terrestrial arthropods depend on a respiratory system rather than a circulatory system to carry oxygen. Um, these, these tracheal tubes uh, branch into smaller and smaller tubes. So here we see our main tracheal tube that comes in and it branches into these smaller tubes here and then these smaller tubes then branch off even into smaller tubules. Um, 
these smaller tubules are going to carry oxygen throughout the body, eventually reaching the muscle. Um, air is going to enter in through an opening called the spiracle. Uh, the spiracle is going to open to the outside, allowing air to enter into the exoskeleton. So the exoskeleton isn't solid. Uh, there are holes in it that, to allow air to come in. Um, other arthropods, like spiders, have, uh, have book lungs. Uh, these are sac-like pockets with highly folded walls for respiration. Um, if you look, again, we're increasing the surface area that's exposed to air, and they're called book lungs because these fo they're folded over so that they look like pages in a book. Um, so here we kind of see these. Here we kind of see these lungs. Here we kind of see these uh, first starting of lungs. Um, we also see a tracheal system. This is this tracheal system. If we were to consider one of our lungs, okay, we have brachial tubes um, that kind of come off and are very similar to these tracheal tubes that we see here. Um, even though most arthropods don't rely on their circulatory system to deliver oxygen, uh, they do rely on their circulatory system to transport nutrients and remove wastes. Um, blood is pumped by the heart through veins uh, that carry the blood to body tissues. Uh, the tissues are then flooded with blood, which returns to the heart through open so it returns to the heart through, uh, through open body spaces. Most uh, arthropods, cellular waste is removed through um, malpignian tubes. Uh, these tubes help terrestrial arthropods main also uh, help them maintain homeostatic water balances. Um, so these tubes extend out from the gut, uh, enter uh, bringing cellular waste to from the blood to uh, to the gut through these uh, malpignian tubes. Uh, they're located in the abdomen, and uh, this is different than what we saw in segmented worms because, like we said, the, mag the these malpignian tubes are actually attached to and empty into the gut, uh, which is going to eventually contain waste, which will ex eventually be uh, be excreted. Um, there are some arthropods like crustaceans, that don't have melpignian tubes. Uh, they do have modified nephedra. Um, arthropods are able to respond to stimuli through a double chain of ganglia throughout their body on their ventral surface. Um, if you take a look, there's fused ganglia. So there's these ganglions that attach uh, there's a, it's a double chain uh, that runs through the ventral surface, but there are fused ganglia. There are fused ganglia in the head region, okay? And these fused, these uh, fused ganglia make up a, uh, make up a brain. Uh, most behaviors like feeding and locomotion can be controlled by ganglia in the individual segment. So these ganglia can control these different uh, different limbs, uh, but the, br the the brain can inhibit can inhibit these actions. Um, if we've ever if you ever had trouble trying to kill a housefly, uh, part of the reason is that arthropods have very accurate vision that allow them to spot even the slightest movement. Um, they can analyze fast moving landscapes, uh, detect movements of prey or predators or mates, uh, and can also detect color. It's because of their compound eye. Um, each compound eye has multiple facets that's in the shape of a hexagon, and each facet returns part of an image. Um, and uh, all these different parts are then put together by the brain. One of the th other things to notice is that these compound eyes 
are located on the side of the head that gives them a much greater range of vision, even to the point of, uh, because they're on the side, almost being able to see behind them. Um, there are also simple eyes in arthropods. Uh, there's about three to eight, depending on what type you're talking about. Um, these simple eyes only have one lens and are mainly for uh, distinguishing between light and dark. Um, in addition to having eyes that can detect movement and distinguish light from dark, many arthropods also have other sense organs called a thymphanum. A thymphanum is a primitive ear. It, uh, it's a flat membrane that vibrates in response to sound waves. Um, it can be located in different places. On crickets, it's on the leg. In grasshoppers, it's on the abdomen and on the thorax of moths. Um, Arthropods can also use antennae to pick up pheromones. Uh, pheromones are chemicals that are excreted by an animal to elicit a behavioral response in other animals of the same species. Um, they, use their, uh, they use their antennae to, to pick up on these pheromones um, and signal behaviors such as mating or feeding. Um, so it's uh, if we talk about dogs, uh, a female dog, when she is in her reproductive cycle, um, release pheromones that are picked up by male dogs. It's called being in heat. Um, that that chemical recept that chemical is then picked up by by the male, letting them know that the female is ready to mate. Um, humans actually try to simulate uh, the release of pheromones uh, by using perfumes and colognes. Uh, we're trying to attract a mate using uh, using the their uh, their sense of smell. Uh, generally speaking, arthropods are quick and active. Uh, they can run, crawl, climb, dig, swim, fly because of these well-developed muscular systems. The muscles in a human leg are attached to the outer surface of bones, while the muscles in an arthropod are attached to the inner surface. Uh, remember, the exoskeleton is on the outside, so these muscles are going to be inside and protected by the exoskeleton, where our endoskeleton is inside, and these muscles attach, these muscles attach on the outside of our skeleton. Uh, another difference is that the strength of muscle contractions in arthropods depends on the rate at which the nerve impulses are, uh, are st stimulate the muscle. So the faster the stimulation, the stronger the muscle contraction. In vertebrates, the strength of muscle contraction depends strictly on the number of muscle fibers. The more muscle fibers, the stronger the contraction. Um, reproduction, most arthropods reproduce sexually and have a variety of adaptations for reproduction. Most arthropods have separate sexes, but a few, like barnacles, are hermaphrodites. Many arthropods protect their eggs in some way, but few offer parental care to their young among, about, uh, upon hatching. When we look at the diversity, there are three major groups. There are the crustaceans. Um, the crustaceans usually have two antennae. Uh, they have two body segments. They have six jointed appendages. And I'm sorry. Uh, they uh, six jointed appendages. And um, well, actually, let's say five pairs of jointed appendages, and swimmerettes, uh, and have two compound eyes. Uh, spiders, the second group, uh, no antennae, no antennae, uh, two body sections, six appendages. Uh, this includes. Uh, This includes uh, four walking legs. Um, so four walking legs, two petty, uh, a pair of pedipalps. Uh, insects have also have antennae. They have compound eyes. They have simple eyes. They have three body regions and three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings. Looking at our first group, the crustaceans, uh, crabs, shrimp, lobsters, crayfish, barnacles, pill bugs, uh, all crustaceans. Uh, they're all marine, uh, freshwater. Uh, they can also be ter terrestrial. 
Uh, crustacean mandibles open side to side. So the open side to side here, uh, not up and down. Uh, if you take a look at Sebastian the Crab, his mandible opens up and down. Uh, if Disney wanted to do this correctly, Sebastian's mouth would have opened like that rather than having a jaw. Um, crustaceans have a free-living larva stage called a nopolis. Uh, these nopolis larvae are an immature stage. Uh, it's different in form and function from the adult. Um, most crustaceans have five pairs of legs. Uh, the first legs are the chelipeds. Uh, so these are the C-H-E-L-I-P-E-D-S. These chelipeds are the large craw claws that are adapted to capture, crush uh, food. Uh, the next pair of legs, the next pair of legs are walking legs. And then in the back are these swimmerettes. Uh, the swimmerettes are used for reproduction and are used uh, as flippers during swimming. Some crustaceans, like barnacles, are sessile, and they use their legs to simply kick food into their mouth. Uh, just under the chelipeds are the eyes and the antenna. Uh, there's two body segments. There's the abdomen. And then, again, the cephalothorax, the, uh, the combined head and thoracic cavities. Spiders belong to the class Arachnidia. Um, most arachnids have two body sections and six pairs of jointed app appendages. They lack antennae. The, uh, the most anterior pair of appendages are modified into mouth parts called chelicera. Okay, these chelicera, <coughs> these chelicera are adapted to function as fangs or pincers and are often connected to a poison gland. The pedipalps are the second appendage. Uh, these are usually used for sensing and for capturing prey. Uh, males use them for reproduction. Um, and scorpions uh, have them modified into large pincers. Uh, the remaining legs are used for locomotion. All spiders are carnivores, some of them actively hunting prey like the wolf spider. And the, uh, and the tarantula, uh, other spiders capture prey in their webs. I'm so sorry, I didn't say oh, Don't worry yourself, you're not alone. Just the same as you and me. Serious and misunderstood creatures spiders are. The eyes, I reckon, they unnerve some. Not to mention pincers. Yeah, I reckon that too. Um, so if we, uh, I guess if we uh, if we take a look at what Harry said, it really probably should have been the chelicera, um, those uh, fangs or pincers that uh, that most that probably unnerved the most people. Um, spider webs are made from a fluid protein that are secreted by glands and spun into silk by the spinnerets. Uh, they're located on the spider's abdomen. So uh, the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man who could make his own webs and shoot them from his wrists. He didn't have to make the, uh, the special bracelets like all the other incarnations of Spider-Man had to do. Um, actually, Toby probably should have been swinging be from building to building, uh, spinning webs from his behind. Um, spiders are capable of spinning only specific types of webs, uh, unlike Spider-Man, who can spin uh, very many. Um, after catching prey, in their webs, many spiders wrap their prey in a silken cocoon until they're ready to feed. In some species, this prey in the cocoon is offered to a female in order to entice her to mate with a male. Some males spin extra silk around the marital gift in order to trick the female into mating with him. Uh, so to reproduce, these male, male spiders deposit a sperm into a small web, uh, picks it up, and stores it in a cavity on its pedipalps. Uh, after the courtship ritual, the male then inserts a sperm packet into the female, and the female s lays her eggs in a cocoon. Uh, there can be up to uh, 100 eggs per cocoon. Uh, some species of spider, some species of spider uh, would then just leave the cocoon, while other species of spider, um, the mother 
the female spider uh, stays around, and um, when the new spiders hatch, they actually feed on the mother. Um, so the mother like sacrifices herself to feed her newborn, her newborn spiders. Uh, other members of the class Arachnidia: uh, ticks, mites, and scorpions. Most mites are less than a millimeter long, with the cephalothorax and abdomen fused into one oval-shaped body segment. Uh, they can be predators or uh, or parasites. They uh, they feed on blood after attaching themselves to the surface of a host. Uh, ticks are uh, ticks also harbor uh, disease-causing agents, uh, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and uh, when they bite, they introduce these disease-causing agents to their host. Uh, some diseases, such as Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, affect humans. Uh, scorpions uh, feed on insects, spiders, uh, small vertebrates that they capture with their pedipalps and tear them apart with their chlorosera. Um, they are generally nocturnal, hiding under logs and or burrowing into the ground during days. During the days, uh, many scorpions in the U.S. will sting. However, they're not uh, necessarily considered dangerous. Uh, if you ever find yourself living in an area where scorpions are uh, are prevalent, uh, one of the things, a good uh, rule of thumb is to take your shoes and to flip them upside down. Uh, if you leave them right side up, scorpions, being nocturnal, may crawl in there searching for that dark space to spend the rest of the day. And when you slip on your shoe, you may get an interesting surprise. Um, horseshoe crabs are an ancient group of marine animals that are related to arachnids. Uh, they've basically remained unchanged since the Triassic period, so and that was about 200 million years ago. Uh, most scientists believe that the horseshoe crab are the closest living relative to the trilobite, which is a marine animal that has been uh, been long extinct. Because horseshoe crabs have been around for about 200 million years, they're often called a, a living fossil. Uh, they have unsegmented, heavy exoskeletons in the shape of a horseshoe. Uh, the chlycera and the pedipalps and the next three pairs of legs and are used for walking and getting food at the bottom of the sea. These animals feed on annelids, mollusks, and any other invertebrates that they capture using their chlycera. The posterior appendages are modified with leaf-like plates that their tips can be used for digging or for swimming. Horseshoe crabs often come to shore to reproduce at high tide. Uh, female digs a hole, deposits her eggs, and the male follows behind and deposits his sperm on them before the female covers the eggs back up with sand. Scientists estimate there's about 300 million insect species, uh, more than every other animal species combined. They're the most widespread terrestrial animals. You can find them in soil, forests, deserts, mountaintops, and even in the polar regions. They have the ability to fly, and their small size enables them to move easily by wind or water. The exoskeleton helps to prevent water loss in the desert. Um, their reproductive capacity is a huge advantage for them. Uh, they produce a large number of eggs, most of which hatch, and the offspring have short life cycles, which leads to huge insect populations in a short period of time. Uh, there are three main body regions. Uh, there's the head, there's the thorax, and there's the abdomen. Um, <coughs> on the head, uh, we see antennae, we see compound eyes, and we see simple eyes. Uh, on the thorax, there are the legs. And there's usually two sets of wings. There's the hind wing and the forewing. Sorry, flip those. This is the forewing. This is the hind wing. And uh, so some uh, some insects only have one pair of wings, while others lack wings completely. Structural adaptations to the legs, mouth parts, wings, and other sense organs have led, to an, have led to the increased diversity in insects. These adaptations enable insects to utilize all kinds of food and to live in a variety of environments. Um, insect legs uh, are different and allow for a variety of different, different jobs. 
Uh, beetles have walking legs with claws that enable them to dig into the soil. Um, flies can walk upside down because their legs uh, have sticky pads on the end. And honeybees have legs with little pouches in them that allow them to collect pollen. The mouth parts of insects are very well adapted to the food that they eat. Uh, like butterflies and moths have a siphon ink appendage. Uh, what it does is this tube uncoils and in allows the insect to suck up the liquid into the mouth. Uh, house flies and fruit flies have a sponge. So uh, what happens is the sponge, the nutrients are uh, sucked up or mopped up like a sponge, and then that allows the uh, the fly to uh, to to get the food that it needs. Uh, mosquitoes insert a uh, in, insert a needle, um, breaking the breaking the leaf, or the plant wall, or the skin, and then allowing. Um, so once it pierces, then it can suck up uh, the nutrients. Uh, and again, these are mosquitoes. And then finally, things like grasshoppers um, and ants are chewing. Um, they can cut animal or plant tissue. Uh, other mouth parts, oops, sorry, um, other mouth parts are going to bring the food uh, into the mouth. Uh, insects are the only invertebrate that can fly. In uh, in birds and flying mammals, the wing is actually a modified limb. Uh, in insects, they're in a, they're uh, a separate outgrowth of the body wall. Uh, wings are often double-layered membranes of chitin with rigid veins to give them strength. Uh, they can be thin like a fly, or thick like a beetle, or even scaly like a butterfly. You can see these scales on the uh, on the butterfly's wing. In order to provide uh, forward thrust, upward lift, balance, and steering, insects often move their wings in this figure eight pattern. That allows them to fly in multiple directions, uh, upwards, downwards, uh, forwards, backwards, uh, and so forth. Insects that do not offer parental care uh, often lay more eggs than insects that do. Uh, this is because uh, if you're going to have a small number of offspring, you're going to you're going to protect them a little bit more. Uh, the greater number of offspring, the harder it is to protect all of them. So insects usually just don't protect any. After hatching, most insects undergo metamorphosis, or a series of major changes from the larval form to the adult form. And, uh, and there's two types. There's a complete metamorphosis, and there's an incomplete. Uh, complete metamorphosis, there's four stages. Uh, there's the egg, the larva, the pupil, and the adult. Um, in the butterfly cycle, the larval form, the caterpillar, uh, has a chewing mouthpiece and behaves uh, like a feeding machine that just eats as much as possible. Um, it molts several times as it grows, and eventually it'll get to the point where it will encase itself into a cocoon. Uh, this pupa stage is a, is a non-feeding stage. It, it, it uses all the nutrients that were gathered as a, as a larva and to power the metamorphosis in which the larva changes into the adult. If the adults feed, they don't use the same feeding source as a larva. Uh, that should make sense because the, lar the adult doesn't want to compete with the larva for food. Incomplete metamorphosis, uh, when the insect hatches, it's a nymph. Uh, it's an immature form of the insect. It looks like a small adult, uh, usually without fully developed wings. After several molts, the nymph will become a full-winged adult. Insects such as ants, honeybees, termites uh, organize into social groups and cooperate in uh, activities that are necessary for their survival. Uh, honeybees, specifically, uh, there can be as many as 70,000 bees in one hive. Um, they, uh, they each have a different, they belong to three different groups. Uh, each group performs a different task. Uh, these are called castes. Um, you may have heard of like a caste system uh, in, in history. Uh, there's different levels, and different levels are responsible for different things. Uh, there's drones, uh, which are the reproductive males. There are the workers, which are females. Uh, they don't reproduce, 
but they, the workers are responsible for, well, the majority of the work. They gather pollen and nectar. They build the honeycomb. They manufacture honey. They care for the young. They guard the hive. Um, and there's only one reproductive female known as the queen. Um, honeybees have evolved an efficient method of communication using body movements to uh, indicate the location and type of food source. This is called a waggle dance. It's performed when a bee returns to the hive from a har far away fruits food source. Um, location, clockwise, counterclockwise. Um, size of the circle that they do, uh, whether they're uh, how they how they move on the inside all gives different information provides different information uh, to the worker bees on the location of a food source. Finally, uh, looking at centipedes and millipedes, uh, centipedes live in moist places and can move very quickly. Uh, they have long segmented bodies and each segment has a pair of jointed legs. Uh, the first pair is modified to form poisonous claws, which a centipede uses to kill its prey. Oftentimes, this a banding color, uh, a banding color on the outside, is a way to tell that an animal may in fact be poisonous. They use it as almost a warning system to things that may eat them. Um, so those are centipedes. Uh, remember from chemistry and physics, uh, centi. Centi means hundred, so centipede means hundred legs. It doesn't actually have a hundred legs, but it has less legs than a millipede. When you look at a millipede, milli means thousand, thousandth. Um, so uh, they actually have two pairs of appendages per segment if we look at their abdomen. Uh, one pair if we look at the, at the segments on their thorax. Uh, millipedes are herbivores and live like centipedes do under rocks or logs. Uh, unlike centipedes, they don't wiggle. They, uh, they, they walk slow with a slow and graceful motion. Uh, no poisonous claws here, uh, as they're herbivores. And they primarily feed on damp and decaying vegetation.